You know what's fascinating? Uh, I'm I can't I'm pretty sure it's the Mahabharata, but I could be wrong. Sort of guessing on this. It's one of the Hindu epics, and it talks about uh, not Krishna, but Krishna's other form, which is uh, Vishnu. And Vishnu's praying, and they're asking Vishnu, "How could who is Vishnu praying to?" At this, we pray to Vishnu. Who is Vishnu praying to? And Vishnu says, "Vishnu is praying to Varuna." And that's like, whoa, Varuna must be high up there. If 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 Vishnu's praying to Varuna, Varuna must be some mega god. You know what I mean? And I, I thought that was pretty fascinating. Yeah, in terms of Varuna, you know, not, I mean, I, I you know, I don't want to jump the gun too much and go hundreds of years forward in terms of history, but whatever. It's not we're not engaged in a history lesson here, so right. who cares? Uh, in terms of Varuna. Another interesting thing is that this Typhonian storm goddess fits very well with the fact that Mithra, uh, Mithraism was the religion of the Cilician pirates, the first uh, major piracy force in the Mediterranean Sea, which was a serious rival of the Roman navy, were a group of uh, pirates fielded by the Parthians by the second major Iranian empire, uh, fielded by the Parthians into the Mediterranean. And they were Mithraists. And in fact, they acted as the primary conduit for the spread of Mithraism from Iran into the Roman Empire. Uh, not, you know, across the battlefields, uh, where the Romans and the Parthians were constantly waging war against one another, but through the elites in the port cities, the Cilician pirates, were wheeling and dealing with the elites in the Roman port cities, and this was one of the main conduits for the spread of Mithraism into the Roman Empire. In any case, though, the fact, you know, people think of Mithra, and then, you know, they think of pirates on the sea, and shouldn't these pirates be worshipping like some Starbucks-like mermaid kind of goddess figure, whatever? Well, they were, because there's this other side of Mithra, namely Varuna, which is a kind of Typhonian storm goddess, which the Iranians later referred to as Anahita. So there's that. I I've also heard that Varuna has a relation to Arenos, some sort of a uh, linguistic re- connection there. But I also I want to ask you this. I've been actually this is a question that I wanted to ask you. The word soldier has S O L in the beginning, and I know that Persian has very closely related to Germanic, and so is uh, Sanskrit. And I'm wondering because I know that Mithra is associated with Sol Invictus. Later on, because, you know, we, like we, t- we already touched on the whole, is Mithra a sun god? Is it not? But later on, when it sort of becomes more of a, in, more of a soul, soul Invictus figure, I, is that word soldier have anything to do with soul Invictus? It's a good question. It could because, well, well first of all, I mean, soul Invictus is a title of Mithra. Okay. It's it, the, the unconquerable or undying sun which, by the way, is not the sun in the sky, if you think about it. The sun in the sky does die. And, it, you know, from, from an ancient, uh, in an ancient way of thinking, the sun dies and is reborn every day. This is a turn of phrase Heraclitus uses in his writings, and you see it in, in various ancient texts in various cultures. The soul invictus is the sun which never sets. Hmm. which is an occult phrase that's used in Plato and it's used in, in other writings. I mean, it's also been referred to as the black sun. Hmm. And uh, so, so in any case, uh, without going too deep into that rabbit hole, um, to answer your initial question, Mithraism has always been a military religion. From the very beginning, it was a, Mithra was a deity adopted by the soldier class. Probably the Kshatriyas, the warrior caste in the Hindu caste system, were worshippers of Mitra from the very beginning. Certainly in ancient Iran, uh, the military worshipped Mitra. We have records of that from the Greeks. Um, even uh, in Achaemenid inscriptions, it's clear that uh, you know Mitra was revered by the by the ancient Persian military, and um, you know, more than any other deity, more than, let's say, Ahura Mazda, once Zoroastrianism became established. But then uh, when we get into the grades of initiation in Roman Mithraism, the, um, 
uh, what is it, the third grade of, of initiation is the grade of the soldier. Hmm. And so, you know, soul, soldier, maybe there's a connection there because, you know, not only was it a military religion, but there's actually a grade of initiation, the grade of the soldier. There he goes. Uh, which, you know, not incidentally is where a lot of the, um, the rights for uh, confirmation in the Catholic Church and the Ash Wednesday ritual come from. This slap on the face that the Catholic priests give someone during a confirmation, that comes from the grade of the soldier. They would smack the soldier in the face, and they would also put an ashen cross on his forehead. And the ashen cross on the forehead has nothing to do with a crucifix or, you know, uh, a, a cross that people were crucified on. The ashen cross is a re reference to the um, celestial equator crossing the uh, ecliptic. It's Okay, so now this takes us into the heart of the Mithraic mystery. The celestial equator and the ecliptic are separated by 23 degrees. And, you know, this is what causes the phenomenon where uh, over the course of 2,000 some odd years, the sun rises into a different constellation. Precession of the equinox. Yeah, exactly. On the morning of the spring equinox. In other words, the precession of the equinoxes, the changing of the zodiacal ages. And so this ashen cross that they would put on the soldier's forehead during the uh, you know, initiation into the grade of the soldier represented cosmic time. And the reason it's ashen is because at the end of the zodiacal cycle, the world is supposed to burn. The whole planet is supposed to burn. Now the world, world would be consumed by fire. There'd be a global conflagration, which is something you see also in the writings of Heraclitus. Um, and it's certainly an idea that um, I, I would say, you know, uh, is adopted by Zoroastrianism from out of an older Mithraism, the idea that at the apocalypse, the world is going to be consumed by fire and uh, sort of alchemically purified, you know, as if the world were being subjected to an alchemical furnace and the lead of this world is thereby transmuted into gold and beings achieve their perfect forms and so forth, right? So this, this cross is the celestial equator and the ecliptic, and it's ashen because it's a reference to uh, the, the apocalyptic um, consumption of the world by fire and the purification of all beings thereby. Uh, so yeah, so that's the initiation uh, rite for the grade of the soldier, and there may indeed be an etymological connection there. So this is fascinating because Mithra, I'm flipping through the, the, the Zoroastrian text, the, um, the Zendavesta. I was going to say Gothas, but it's not. This is Zendavesta. And all of a sudden I'm reading through it for the first time. And I didn't, I, I'm thinking this is a monotheistic religion and there's just Ahura Mazda and Anger Ma. All of a sudden I get to a page and it says Mithra, the mediator. What? What is going on? And there's Mithra again. So Mithra being a mediator plus the 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 uh, morning star, if you go to the Bible, what is Jesus? The mediator, also titled the morning star. And but so I don't know. We we can argue about how Christianity came about, if Jesus was a real person or not. That doesn't matter at all. What matters is, but by the time it gets to Constantine, he's taking the rights of Mithra, and I, and I want to hear what you think about this. He's obvious, I think, obviously taking the rights of Mithra, the December 25th. And he, I think he had a decision to make. He had to make an executive decision. Look, we have, we're split. Our soldiers, they need a religion. They, they're not going to go out and fight for us if they don't think they're going to die and go to a heaven for their honor for dying. And, and th you know, that's, that's one of those things that you hype up your soldiers with. So you got these Christian soldiers, you got these Mithraic soldiers. How do we bring the two together? I think Constantine. Would be uh, masterfully brought the two together by bringing the rites in, but also applying the uh, the uh, scriptures of the Christians and making this sort of universalist religion. What do you think about that? Obviously, the case. Look, <laughs> first of all, Mithra is born on what became Christmas. 
Okay, number one. Mithra is born on the winter solstice, which was then shifted due to calendrical changes, right, to, to where Christmas is. Mithra was born of a virgin. The Mithras celebrated a communion where they uh, uh, drank wine, which, by the way, their wine was spiked with Amanita, Muscaria, uh, mushrooms, uh, which grow under what kind of trees? Evergreen trees. What's the color scheme of Amanita muscaria mushrooms? Red and white, and then the evergreen is green. green. Well, there's the Christmas color scheme. Okay, I, actually, that's number that's four right there. Okay, uh, and by the way, also in that communion feast, they would eat bread that was circular in form and inscribed by a cross. Here's your communion wafer and also the breaking of uh, of bread, right? In you know. Uh, and then you have um, all of the uh, iconography of the bishops and the cardinals and so forth, you know, with these tall hats that they wear. Well, this is a, you know, preservation of the Phrygian cap, the, the red Mithraic cap. Uh, and then the robes even, you know, the red robes and so forth. Those were the robes of Mithraic magi. There it is right there. Right? Yeah. I mean, there are uh, actually mosaics showing the three magi coming to the birth of Jesus, and they're wearing these, you know, Mithraic uh, caps and uh, robes, uh, red, red caps and robes, um, which, which is another thing, right? I mean, it's so obvious. Look, why do you have three magi coming to the birth of Jesus? And by the way, I, I, I think that people who uh, try to take that as evidence for some kind of a Zoroastrian influence on Christianity are mistaken. These were Mithraic magi who appear, well, whether you want to take that story as literal or not or whatever, right. even if it's a, a literary device, the intention is to depict Mithraic priests because at the time of the supposed birth of Jesus, you had the Parthian Empire in power in Iran and the Parthians, unlike the Achaemenids before them, or the Sasanians after them, the Parthians were Mithraists. They were not Zoroastrians. So, you know, the Magi at that time in Iran, to be a Magus meant to be a Mithraic priest. So you have these Mithraists coming, you know, at the birth of this, this character. Uh, and then, you know, when you start to, to get into the... Uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is baptism was also practiced in, in Mithraism in connection to Anahita, the water goddess Anahita. Yeah. So you have all of these elements of Mithraic ritual. I mentioned the, the initiation of the grade of the soldier earlier. All of these elements of uh, ritual and initiation and so forth that were borrowed from Mithraism straight into Christianity. But then when you get into the more esoteric teachings attributed to Jesus and the Gospels, you also find, you know, um, Mithraic metaphysics and uh, es essentially uh, secret doctrines that far predate Christianity and that you find, you know, um, in Parthian uh, Iran and, uh, you know, perhaps going back even further. Here's one right now for you. There is a poet, and you probably might know the name. I can't think of his name right now, but it's somewhere in like the second or third century BC, maybe even closer to the first, maybe early, like whatever. But he wrote a story about Mithridates the sixth having been his birth being signified by a star from the east, saying, "Here, a uh, uh, Messiah is going to be born." And they said they they had a genealogy, I guess, was written out that brought his um his uh his genealogy from on one side of his family alexander the great who everyone is like a world like everyone that's like the greatest it gets and then on the other hand cyrus the great from persia so here we have this mithridates character whose name literally means mithra's abode i think right and he is being told as the star in the east signifying his birth world messiah it can't get any closer than that so a few things about that. Um, by the way, the, the name uh, Mithridates uh, or Mehrdad in the original Persian means 
either given by Mithra or Mithra's justice, Mithra's law. Da the word data uh, is where we get the word data from in English. Our word data comes from the Persian data. And data means literally the given, but figuratively law. Wow. And so it's Mithra's law or Mithra's justice. Uh, and a, b a bunch of Parthian kings had this name, Mithridates. It was a very popular name for the Parthian kings in particular. Uh, and then Mithridates the Mithridates the second was that guy who fielded the uh, pirate navy in the Mediterranean that I was talking about earlier. He basically set up, yeah, he set up the Cilician pirates as a black ops navy. Wow. Mithridates the sixth, which is the one you were talking about which they get, you know, constructed a gene genealogy for him, uh, you know, that would bring together the Greeks and the Persians, saying he was descended both from Cyrus and from Alexander. That Mithridates VI is responsible for the Mithraic symbol of the skull and crossbones winding up on poison bottles because he was infamous for assassinating people by means of poisoning. The poison the king. Poison king. And... The main symbol of Mithraism is actually the skull and crossbones, wow. which, which is, by the way, how it wound up on pirate flags, too, because the Cilician yeah. pirates flew this thing, you know, in the Mediterranean at the time of the Roman Empire. Uh, and what the skull and the crossbones that Mithridates VI uh, wound up, uh, you know, having associated with poison bottles in all of our minds, what it actually means is... Again, the plane of the zodiac crossing the celestial equator, those are the bones. The bones are supposed to be separated by 23 degrees, exactly. And the skull over the bones, because what is this? This is time, right? It's cosmic time. Well, the skull over the bones is also a reference to time, namely as death. In other words, this cosmos is a meat grinder, right? Time kills. And... So what this skull over the crossed bones uh, is meant to suggest is that we live in the realm of time and death, governed by a figure that the Persians call Zorvan, or that the Greeks referred to as Kronos. Right? Saturn in his guise, not as a planet Saturn, but as the god of time, the lord of time. And the central, uh, I, I don't know, myth or teaching of Mithraism, the, the central mythic image of Mithraism, which, you know, um, is also the core teaching of the religion, is the idea that Mithra shows us a path to overpowering the Lord of Time. Okay, so Mithra supposedly is able to transcend the earthly realm, stand out over the planet and shift the earth, uh, there, thereby changing the zodiacal age, right? And overpowering the Lord of time, namely Zorvan or Kronos. That's the central teaching of Mithraism is how to overcome the power of time and death and not be subject to fate because, you know, uh, the Greeks and, and uh, pretty much all other ancient people saw the movement of the stars as the uh, as visible fate, basically, as a testimony to the fact that we have no free will and our lives are governed by these, uh, you know, merciless and uh, unchanging celestial forces. Well, there was one phenomenon in the ancient world that once it was noticed uh, was an exception to that celestial regularity. And that's the procession of the equinoxes. So these people got it into their heads that Mithra is responsible for the procession of the equinoxes. And what that is, is Mithra shifting the axis of the world uh, a, a, as a basically testimony to the fact that we can have power over um, the Lord of, of time. Uh, who's responsible for the movement, the regular movement of the planets and the stars.